my lights. Let's turn on the lights here. Hold on. One moment. Oh, come on. There it is. Hello! Let there be light. And there was. And there is. Nick, wonderful to see you. Welcome in. So. I think I figured out what's wrong with the 3D printer. And I have my suspicions after uh, after the last failure. Uh, which was this guy. This is my current suspicion. Because when it acted weird like that. So, I'm, you know, I'm doing all right, Nick. I was able to finally sort out some uh, some healthcare stuff. I had a, had to get a prescription renewed, and I had issues with my entire health card. Uh, because, you know, here's a really fun thing. Did you know? Uh, I moved from Ontario to Quebec back in the late 90s. From there, moved all over Canada. Most recently, came from BC to Ontario. Uh, and I just had the audacity to have Quebec involved. And as a result, uh, the person from the Ontario Health Office uh, just basically went, yeah, no, you must have moved back from Quebec because clearly nobody moves out of province and then back from a different province than they moved to. Uh, so, went to use my health card and they were like, no, we can't, they, no, it got cancelled. Uh, you don't have a health card. Great. Anyways, that's sorted. Got that fixed. Uh, and I'm hoping we can get some other stuff fixed tonight. Uh, so, this here is the big ol' uh, block power supply for my 3D printer. Uh, this form factor we oftentimes refer to it as a cheese grater. Not because of this one, but because normally they don't have as much metal as this. They tend to look more like this. And we tend to refer to these as the cheese grater power supplies. For obvious reasons, once I put this one on screen. Um, yes. <laughs> I call this one a cheese grater, it looks a bit weird. I call that one a cheese grater and you'll go, oh, that makes sense. Yeah, so, figured I'd pull this one on screen as well. But, here's the thing with these uh, power supplies, is um, if, with a 3D printer, you start having weird thermal issues, um, what ends up happening is your voltage reference starts moving, and when your voltage reference starts moving, it starts changing the frequency, amount, uh, frequency of your drive signal. Now, if that means your main board is overheating, your servo, uh, your stepper motor is overheating, uh, your power supply is overheating. You can end up with all sorts of wonky behaviors. Now, I've dealt with stepper motor overheating in the past. I've dealt with main board overheating in the past. And I've dealt with power supply being non-functional. Uh, but what I had an issue with on this specific power supply previously was that it was getting outrageously loud. And I put a little Noctua fan on it to quiet it down, right? Now, the problem I've run into, and I have my suspicions that the print would go fine for the first little bit, and then it would fail. Jazzy, welcome in. How are you doing, my friend? Um, I have my suspicion because I was able to get some prints to work, and then I had other prints fail, but partway through, but not at a consistent point, and I had it both succeed and fail on the same part with respect to uh, distortion of the file. Now, that tends to happen when you are getting some kind of overheating, some kind of misbehavior in your control signal. You know, I'm doing alright, Jazzy. I'm doing alright. I got some stuff sorted out today, and I'm hopefully going to fix my 3D printer today. So, uh, what I did is I looked at, uh, I turned on my 3D printer and I went, okay, so if it is a thermal issue, uh, generally, these printers can't tell you. Um, you know, if it's the main board, you might have some kind of warning system built in. You know, OctoPrint will be able to tell me my uh, Raspberry Pi uh, temperature. So if the Raspberry Pi that's driving in is overheating, I'll know. But like the main board, I'll have no idea. I'll have no idea if this power supply is overheating because there is no control signal to uh, communicate between the two sets. Now, so what I did is I turned on the printer and I cranked up all the uh, I 
picked up the heated bed and the nozzle. And the heated bed is technically, technically speaking, uh, an AC bed, but it still does consume DC power to run it uh, because it's got a little control signal and other stuff like that. But I turned on the nozzle and I let it set, sit there for five-ish minutes. This power supply should have turned on its fan within the first couple uh, within the first couple of minutes, and it didn't. So it's making me believe that something's gone wrong inside of this power supply, which is preventing that fan from coming on. And as a result, the fan's not coming on, so the temperature is rising. And the temperature is rising, which means that the temperature feedback control loop on these is not working. And we are getting this kind of repeating failure where, because this should, if I remember correctly how this was wired up, this should just turn on. When I put the power to the uh, power supply, it should just turn on. Now, I do have to be careful here because I did just have this thing plugged into the wall. Uh, it's been a few minutes, but it is still something to be aware of uh, that these big old cans right here, these are capacitors, they will hold a charge and they will hold 120 volts and they will zap me with 120 volts and it hurts. Uh, <laughs> more than just hurting, it can be technically uh, lethal. Um, from inside of here, it's highly unlikely it actually would be, but there is the possibility and more, more to the point, I just genuinely don't really feel like uh, getting hit with mains power tonight. Um, you know, other nights it might might sound like a fun time. Realize the place is in the wrong spot. Hello, Jazzy buying an ear beater. That is fantastically exciting. Honestly, I've I've got an e reader, I've got a tablet, and I got my phone. And whenever I'm doing ebooks, I tend to read them on my phone. But that's usually because I'm reading them in like, you know, airports and emergency rooms. I don't tend to do a lot of a lot of ebooks, but whenever I do find one that interests me, I do. I will pull out the e-reader. I, I like my paper books, though. I uh, I won't lie. That's not necessarily the power set, power cables that I wanted. Those are just extensions. Who are these guys? Who are these? Yeah, those work. So what we're going to do, I I do like, so I so my e-reader is just a tablet, basically, with a good battery life, so it's not like an e-paper display, uh, so that does change kind of my perspective on my personal tablet, which is just that it's a less capable tablet than uh, uh, I otherwise have access to. Okay, so... This fan should, when I put power on here, just spin. Um, I currently have my power supply. I've got to grab some leads here that can make that work. That'll work. If you're cheeky, you might be able to ask some North American, uh, uh, North American friends for like lo uh, library logins if they're not using them. Yeah, Nick, you're a you're a voracious reader as well, if I remember right. Uh, all right, so we should be able to go here. We should go here. Alright, so that's the fan spinning. Doesn't look super different, apart from the fact that the blades disappear. It's so quiet. Hey, Rain, welcome in. Yeah, there are even some, uh, Jazzy, there are even some libraries that don't actually ask for uh, reference or residence or anything like that. You can just sign up online. 
I know a couple of them have done that to get around, like, uh, to help uh, certain municipalities and stuff like that get around banned books. So you might want to just look around. There might be a couple of libraries you could just sign into remotely as well. You know, Nick, I, I tend to have kind of an ebb and flow relationship with reading as well. Um, all right. So we know the fan is working. I didn't think the fan was problematic because this is a, a Noctua fan. It's a fairly... two live leaves hanging in the breeze. Uh, it's the equivalent of sticking a fork in a socket. So
that is me measuring to uh, earth ground for my AC power, uh, my wall power. So 3.2 volts AC. And if I check DC, we might actually get even more. Nope. Okay. But it is saying that this AC point, this AC ground, this AC earth is not actually at zero volts. And that's not actually a problem. It's something very interesting about how we um, kind of consider our power and how we use our how we use these kinds of systems is that that not being equal to zero volts isn't a problem so long as this whole system is accepting and totally fine with three volts being uh, zero. And generally it is. Now, if I connect it to another system and I were to now connect this earth to a different system's earth, I would have three volts here and say the other one's actually running at zero. I would actually have a current running from this earth to that earth. So you got to be mindful about how about different earth potentials. It's the same reason why uh, if you want to connect two microcontrollers or you want to connect a USB device, you want to connect any kind of any kind of microcontroller to another microcontroller or some kind of analog or digital circuitry together, uh, you have to find some way of giving them the same reference point. Uh, now, there is technically a way around that uh, because you can have um, differential measurements. Uh, systems like UART, um, which is what you tend to use, like can, um, uh, CAN bus, which is what your car uses. So your, your car would communicate back up and down the car different systems. Uh, you know, your, uh, your fuel gauge, your backup camera, your, you know, tire pressure monitoring system, all those kind of pieces, they'll be zipping back and forth communications with high speed, uh, CAN bus, which is a, uh, UART, which is, um, something asynchronous, asynchronous serial transmission or something or other like that. But basically what they do is they still use two wires, but whereas everybody else would use one for ground and then one for voltage, and then you just wiggle this one up and down to send that signal. What UART does is it takes both of them and goes, uh, great, uh, so long as this one is below this one, or this one is below that one, if this one's higher than that one, that's a, you know, that's a one. If this one's higher than that one, that's a zero. So it doesn't matter where on the scale it is. If we're comparing the two lines to each other, if I have a plus 40 volt offset, I just pull the offset out and I just consider the two lines with respect to each other. It's a lot more resilient to noise. Uh, so that can help with a lot of different pieces of that nature. Um... Burr, 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 burr. There we are. Uh, yeah. So what we're going to do, we're going to very carefully, we're going to reach down with a DC voltage measurement. Um, and we're going to poke our little fan header and just see. Zero volts. So for some reason, this, this power supply has just given up on sending 12 volts to my fan header. I don't know why immediately. And it's mildly annoying because that is not normally a header that would fail. Now I immediately sus suspect something like there's a little capacitor right here or a resistor that are hanging out right there. I'm assuming these are supporting components for that fan. And I'm wondering if one of those supporting components has not failed. Not seeing anything here that looks explicitly toasty. Now, one thing I will say, uh, for one, if you do not know what you are touching, do not stick your finger into a plugged in appliance. Uh, two, if you do have to, you one thing that you can't see is uh, I actually have my hand pulled back so that I'm touching with one finger on one hand in a context where my other hand can't get anywhere near that other that device. 
if I drop something, if something falls, if something or otherwise, I'm only going to make contact with one hand. And that is generally really important when you're working with these kind of devices, because uh, if I get zapped from like this finger to this finger, say I'm touching here and my knuckle touches the base, we've already established there is 60 volts between that earth and uh, these leads. I don't fully trust that value. Um, I would still assume that I'm going to get a full 120 volt zap if I touch here and the case. So if I'm like resting my hand here and trying to poke, I'm probably going to get a zap uh, if I touch the wrong thing. Now, there is the additional factor, though, um, that obviously I know where I'm look where I'm poking. But like if I happen to go from here to here, like I know this is safe. So but if if I got zapped here and went to here. Well, it's going to go up this finger and down this one. It's going to hurt. My fingers are going to twist and pull. Hello, Muff Mom. Welcome in. My fingers aren't going to be happy with me, but it's a very, very big difference between touching with this hand, holding, holding the case, and then touching something in here. It goes up one arm, across the chest, and down the other arm. And that's a really, really big problem. Because that's where you get problems with the heart. And uh, you can stop your heart with as little as 10 milliamps, which is basically nothing. Um, you'll probably get more than 10 milliamps by licking a button cell battery. Um, so it's very, very easy to hit that mark. Now, I'm going to pull this thing out of the case. Yellow zip tie. It is in my view viewpoint now. Um... So now I know that this circuit is de-energized. It is in my viewpoint, and additionally, I'm going to unplug that piece. And I'm going to put this off to the side now. So I have this here. I'm going to start on the outside of the case. And I need to specifically make it so I can get these... Um, these pieces off. Apparently, last time I came in here, I didn't actually do this, which is interesting. Um, I thought I had actually pulled this guy apart previously, but apparently not. Uh, one thing that you'll notice, though, is I'm starting on the outside, and I'm working my way in and back. So what I'm basically doing is giving these guys time to discharge. Because usually... They'll have some big, some big resistor like these guys here, uh, that are meant to discharge them. If it's designed properly, there'll be some discharge capacitors there. Uh, saying that it's dis uh, that it's uh, designed properly is a very big if, because some designers just straight up just don't put lead capacitors on things. Uh, they see them as a waste of power, uh, which is a viewpoint that you can take um it's the wrong viewpoint but it is one that you can take um all right so we're just going to pull this guy fully out this one here is causing me problems but we should be able to then slide Release that. By the time it gets back, by the time this gets out to me, we might actually have shorted it against the case, so we'll see what that looks like. Come on. Okay. That one's also causing me problems. Out we go. So these little things are just clamps that are meant to uh, connect our heat generating components to the frame of the device uh, which helps us quite a lot with heat dissipation go figure who the thunk the heat dissipation panels dissipate heat probably a screw somewhere around over here there it is. Stickers are oftentimes covering up sneaky screws. Now, one thing that is worth noting is in North America, at least, 
It is technically illegal for a manufacturer to void your warranty by you opening a device. That is, however, with the understanding that uh, that is a legal definition. And they can certainly make your life very difficult before uh, you actually get them to pay out. So if you do have a warranty, if you do have the ability to just return a device to the store uh, in our current consumer consumer ecosystem, I would highly recommend that if you can replace it for free, that you exactly do that. Um, just because while it is technically illegal for a company to void your warranty for taking off a warranty, warranty void if removed sticker, uh, that doesn't mean that company still won't do it and just assume that you're not going to fight them on it because they're probably right. I mean, who realistically has the money to fight, you know, some massive company for this? Okay. Now, one thing we're going to take a look at, we're going to see where are we at as far as this device? So we're going to measure here. So this is what we were talking about. So you see this? This is 3.5 volts. And it is slowly draining. And this one's got 1.5. This one has 1.7. So that's basically telling me that there is actually power across those capacitors. Now, it's small power. It's not a lot of power at this point. Um, but even how long we took... That still did actually manage to maintain some power. Now, I did just short it out, so we're probably safe. Yep. <laughs> Not the best way to check a board, but it is effective. <laughs> You'll find out real quick. If you are going to do something that's stupid like that, do it this way. And not with a ring on. But do it this way, because that way your hand will close away from the board. <laughs> um... That was actually part of our official uh, telecom training is we had all these tools for like testing the poles to see if, you know, like mains power, like a secondary had come down onto the pole and energized it to the earth or whatever. We had these little sticks to poke the poke the thing and it was a go, no go. Yes, this is might be OK or whatever. Uh, and it was a whole procedure. Uh, that being said, the old guys, at the company still took the time and it was still part of our official training. That even if the stick says it's good, even if this very expensive piece of equipment says that you're fine and it's safe and it's okay and you're all good to go, uh, before you actually try and connect to the pole, you go, you just whack it with the back of your hand, which was what the old guys always did before they had the expensive tool. But that did end up resulting in us having fewer old guys to work. So it wasn't something that they took kindly to. Um, so looking at the bottom here, um, don't see anything, I mean, I see a vision, evidence of rework, and I don't know if it was me or if it was somebody else. I'm going to be inclined to think it was somebody else.
on 